Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labacan with the Rocks and Stocks News Show. It is March the 22nd. Uh, a few hours ago, the Federal Reserve put on a dog and pony show, and they really think people are stupid. Um, Fed Chairman is uh, definitely wearing rose-colored glasses. He came out and uh, after they decided to go ahead and raise a quarter of a percent, um, which was pretty much baked in the cake. I, I thought they would not raise interest rates. Some were even calling for them to cut rates, uh, but they went right ahead with their quarter point move. And uh, really to me, it um, I think they're out of touch with reality uh, and uh, are quite delusional. He came out and called the banking um, the he called them banking events. Um, sorry, but everybody on the planet knows that this is a banking crisis. To come out and say that it's a banking event, and then say that the economy is sound, that the uh, uh, banking is strong in strong shape, uh, that um, the Silicon Valley Bank and the Others that have imploded are outliers. Uh, it's just totally out to lunch and uh, really doesn't, um, to me, I think an important part of their, uh, their speech should have been that they understand that they helped cause this crisis. Uh, and it is nothing, it is absolutely a banking crisis. Um, the Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, Bank, um, First Republic, Credit Suisse, uh, and the others, uh, the, the problem that they're having is that they held a bunch of assets and long-term um, mortgage-backed securities and long-term uh, bonds and uh, are underwater because of all the uh, rate increases by the Federal Reserve. That's the underlying problem. And... Um, no acceptance, no real, no basis of reality that they help cause this current banking crisis. And if they think that it's going to be a short-term situation, uh, they're really not getting the big point. Uh, this is a domino effect that's happening because they're not the only banks that um, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, Signature Bank, Credit Suisse, they're not the only ones that are sitting on uh, uh, underwater assets that um, can't, they can't uh, service their deposits with. And, and in reality, I think they know this. That's why they're talking about the possibility that they may insure all depositors. That's $18 trillion. Um, that's an awful lot of money printing. And, 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 the thought that they that they believe that they're that the the dominoes aren't going to continue to um, fall is really um, irresponsible and uh, sending a bad message that they don't they don't get it uh, and uh, but you'll we're going to see what's going to happen and what's going to happen is the smaller banks are going to continue to see mass outflows of their depositors that take that money into the big banks. If they don't, they need their heads examined uh, because uh, you got to be where the banks are too big to fail in, in, in as far as the FDIC, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the government are concerned. Uh, that's the safest place you can put your money if you want to put it in a bank. Um, and uh, I believe that the investors are going to keep running for the exit as well. You need, you need it's insane for investors and depositors uh, to keep their money in these small banks. There, there's a lot of them that are having the same problem. In fact, so is the Federal Reserve. Their balance sheet is full of this kind of stuff where they. They were uh, the biggest buyer of bonds and mortgage-backed securities on the planet. They're sitting on $8 trillion of, uh, of uh, underwater investments, and uh, that's losing them money. Um, they can't 
backstop everything. Uh, and um, ultimately, I think that a lot of these smaller banks are going to go under. Um, I, I really don't understand why anybody would have their money deposited in them, uh, nor be invested in them. Okay, so that's the, the rant for today about the uh, Federal Reserve and their their uh, lack of acceptance of the problem that they caused after 14 years of near zero interest rates, followed by ratcheting the rate hikes up to 5% now um, and not realizing that they're causing the problem uh, is unbelievable to me. And it's not just going to affect the banking sector. It's going to affect investment uh, bankers. It's going to affect uh, funds that hold these kind of assets. I mean, why as an investor do you want to hold instruments that are exposed to that kind of stuff? Uh, I just don't get it. But let's talk about where uh, I think that investors should be paying attention to. Um, I believe that the best place for investors that want to protect their money is in uh, gold and silver. And for those that want to see their money grow, I think it's best in gold and silver stocks. Um, and uh, I think that that's the best path forward for investors of where they should be putting their money. Uh, again, if you want to protect, put it into the metals. If you want to see it grow, put it into the stocks. And the reason I say that that's the best place to see your money grow is that I'm very bullish on the price of gold, silver, copper, and other metals. Uh, and, uh, and I think that the valuations of the companies are so cheap right now that as the price of the metals get higher, um, those stocks, the stocks in those companies are going to blast off. And so let's get into some stocks. Talked enough about the Federal Reserve and their lunacy. Um, let me uh, let me share a screen here. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, go over my uh, my recent report that I think is very instructive uh, on what I think is happening and some good opportunities for investors to park their cash. So uh, in this report that I put out on March the 18th, I talked about all the craziness happening in the banking system and the Federal Reserve. Uh, this is a, a chart that I put out that I think is very important. Um, and what it is is the Lasson curve. Pierre Lasson uh, is one of the legends in the gold mining space. Uh, and he put this curve out to help investors understand the life cycle of a, a junior mining company that then goes on to be a, a producer. You'll see two big spikes here. One is here and one is here. Um, these are the sweet spots. So this is when a company is in the final stages of developing a new mine and then it goes into production and you get a big run there. The other one is over here in the discovery, but before they make a discovery and then a big run when they make a discovery. There's also this orphan period that's called the uh, development discount window by many. And I don't spend as much time in here, but I think there is an opportunity to make money in companies that are in that development discount window, especially when you're transitioning from a bear market into a bull market. And that's exactly where I see us right now. And uh, what happens is that these, these development companies that are, are moving toward through feasibility and onto development, their stocks can get very hammered down uh, in a bear market. And, and that's the odd situation that I will look at when a company's in a development discount window. But these are the two sweet spots right here and right here. And that's the bulk of the companies that I pick, okay? Um, actually, I'm gonna go to the, before I start talking about stocks, uh, let's look at the, uh, here is the uh, uh, price of the US dollar, uh, the US dollar index. 
as you can see during the uh, uh, 22, late 21, 22, look at the big move that the US dollar was on as the uh, Federal Reserve was talking about and then raising interest rates. Uh, and then it rolled over and came off quite dramatically. Um, uh, and then in February, it had a rally uh, because there was some strong economic news and uh, people were thinking that the Federal Reserve would go back to a half a point to three quarter point moves and it caught a bid. Uh, but then that has failed and look at this action today. It is now trading below the 50-day moving average again, and I think it's going to head much lower, and this 200-day uh, moving average will roll over. Now, let's have a look at uh, gold. Uh, here we go. Here's gold. And uh, as you can see here, had a very good, uh, well, actually, this doesn't show today. Uh, it it's the end of the day price, but this is showing yesterday's end of the day. Nonetheless, went up even higher from this 1949 level. Um, had a great run in uh, from November to uh, to the end of January. Then when the U.S. dollar got powerful, it uh, corrected, had a double bottom. And then as the uh, banking crisis hit, it's blasted off again. Uh, it's now trading aggressively above the 50-day moving average and almost $200, well, around right around $200 above the 200-day moving average. And I think what we're going to see is that this continues to go much higher. I think we're within days of it breaking through 2,000 and staying above 2,000 for an extended period of time. Uh, silver is uh, another one that I'm very bullish on. And um, as you can see here, uh, had a good uh, November rally, kind of went flat in January, came back uh, during February, and then it's now blasted off again. It's trading above the 50-day moving average. Uh, Silver is looking quite uh, primed to go much higher. Um, it always follows gold. And if you think that gold is going up like I think it is, uh, I think you're going to see a pretty big run in the price of silver. Uh, copper is had a good run from November until January, softened up in February. Um, actually showed some relative strength there. Uh, has rallied just in the last, as the banking crisis. Now, some would say, well, if there's going to be an economic slowdown in the U.S., isn't that going to be negative for the price of copper? And I don't think it will be because there's two more important factors. One is what's happening in China because they're the biggest consumer of copper and uh, they uh, pulled their restrictions on COVID and they're sort of back to business now. And so they're going to consume a lot of copper. And the big driver is the electric vehicle revolution. Not only do electric vehicles need a lot of copper, uh, but to get the energy from the to the cars, you're going to need a lot of copper. And moving that energy around uh, is when you're doing it in an aging or ancient um, uh, power grid, that power grid needs uh, re rewiring. So all of these things are going to conspire to be very bullish for our high demand for copper. Now, um, uh, the, um, uh, the other thing that I think is important to pay attention to is that uh, when the federal, I, I believe that even though the Federal Reserve chairman today said that they are not looking at uh, raising or lowering interest rates in 2023, when they say they're not, you can usually assume that they are thinking about it. And uh, I believe that they're going to have to because this, I don't believe that this banking crisis is anywhere near an ending. I think the dominoes are just starting to fall. Uh, there's a lot of holders of assets uh, that are underwater compared to the interest rates that they can get now in bonds. And uh, some of these are big institutions that are gonna definitely be affected uh, by the, um, the current, uh, 
situation with their underwater investments in bonds that um, some of them are going to start rolling over and they're uh, they're going to be taking losses and that's going to ha have snowball. Uh, the dominoes are just starting to fall. Okay, now I'll get on to the stocks. And uh, one of my uh, top picks for investors uh, in the, that one exposure to gold is I-80 Gold. Uh, IED Gold started trading back in uh, around this time two years ago. They're the product of um, uh, they were they were a spin out from when Premier Gold uh, was taken over, and uh, they uh, Premier Gold was taken over by Equinox mainly for their project in Ontario near Geraldton. Uh, so they spun off all of the Nevada projects into I-80 Gold. And since then, I-80 has done a terrific job enhancing those assets and adding more assets. Uh, some of the assets that they added since they've been a public company is they added a, um, a processing facility that they purchased and um, they got it at a very reasonable price. And what's this is going to enable them to do is to um, have the capacity to process refractory ore, it's called. Uh, it, and um, usually those kind of facilities cost a billion or more. And right now the valuation of the company is less than the replacement cost of their processing facility. <clears throat> now in 2021, uh, and early 2022, they had a lot of success because of their uh, Granite Creek project in Nevada. Uh, what makes this very exciting is that um, they've drilled about a 600 meter strike length uh, on their what they call the South Pacific zone. And uh, they've got excellent continuity of high grade. It's open to the north. And as you keep going to the north in the same kind of rocks, same geological structures, you run into a 25 million ounce deposit that's on the other side of their their claims. Uh, so this has a lot, it's in elephant country and it has a lot of room to keep getting bigger and it's open at depth. And what is also important is as they go deeper, the grades get higher. This is definitely in your two to five or more million ounce target type scenario. Uh, and uh, it's also permitted. So they're building underground um, development to bring that into production. They currently have some production coming out of that uh, that mine uh, and um, it's being processed at uh, Nevada Minings, um, which is a joint venture between uh, um, Barrick and Newmont. Uh, they, they are having it processed at another facility and they still got a low cost of production. So when they get their own facility up and running, they're going to have uh, more profits coming from that. But then in 2022, things got really exciting at their Ruby Hill project because they started to drill into, first of all, the Ruby Deeps deposit, which was to the west and uh, uh, of a historical open pit. Uh, and there they found big, thick intersections of high-grade material for a bulk underground mining target. And uh, that looks like it could be a world-class project. And, and then around it, uh, to higher up in the system and right near the bottom of that old pit, they found more oxide gold in what they call their 426 zone. Uh, and then under, right underneath the pit, they found uh, more gold. Uh, so just on the gold alone at Ruby Hill, uh, it looks like they've got a world-class situation there. But then to the south of the pit, right around here, when this blast off happened, uh, they announced that they hit a CRD, a carbonate replacement deposit, uh, which has exceptional grades of silver, lead, zinc, and gold. Now, usually these CRD deposits don't have much in the way of gold, but they're hitting bonanza grades of gold in this CRD. Uh, what's equally exciting about that is that right at the Ruby Hill plant or uh, facility, 
they have a plant there that can process those base metals. Um, so that's going to have, in, about a year ago, they were talking about one potential processing plant. Now it looks like they're going to have two because of the CRD discovery. Uh, they had a tremendous run from November until the end of January. Then, like a lot of uh, stocks, the February came around and they got beaten down. Uh, they had a golden cross in January, and uh, now they're trading right around their 200-day moving average. But with what I see coming out of um, uh, the gold price, I think that they're about to take off again. Uh, something else that they've recently done is that they've made a uh, an offer to take over Paycor Minerals. I'm really excited about that because both I-80 Gold and Paycor are sponsors of my shows uh, and my reports. And uh, I was really early into um, reporting on all the success that they were having. Uh, now that they're merging into one company, uh, I think it's a great deal for I-80 Gold shareholders. And I also think it's a great deal for Paycor shareholders because Paycor had one project uh, that eventually would have to go through the development discount window and probably not that far into the future. And uh, they would also need a processing facility uh, to bring it into production. Right next door, I-80 Gold has a facility that can process their material. And uh, so if the goal is to uh, be part of the mining of that deposit, um, it's much better in the hands of I-80 Gold and the Paycor shareholders get access to all the great assets that uh, I-80 Gold has. And I-80 Gold is really on a growth curve that I think will lead them to be a multi-billion dollar company of the future. So that's the I-80 Gold story. And I also touched somewhat on Paycor, but I'll bring them up now. Uh, as you can see, this company is only like a year old. And in a year, this was a tough time for all junior mining stocks right in from here to here. Uh, but then they started announcing their own results of a high grade CRD with high grades of silver, lead, zinc and gold. And uh, their stock blasted off. Now, they didn't get punished nearly as much as a lot of companies did and have are now trading above the 50 day moving average. They're such a young company that even their 200-day moving average is only a, a small portion of this chart. Uh, but I think that as they uh, as they get closer to being taken over and gold moves up, this one's sort of moving in lockstep with the price of I-80 gold based on the, um, uh, the percentage of shares that they will get into I-80 gold. So I think that's 0.68 of a share of Paycor for a share in I-80 Gold. So it's trading uh, pretty much in lockstep with that um, uh, exchange ratio. Okay, so I talked about I-80 Gold. Another um, uh, miner that I'm very bullish on is McEwen Mining. Uh, McEwen Mining, let me pull them up here. And uh, McEwen Mining, had a pretty tough 2022. And a lot of that was caused because they were having problems at their gold mining facilities and operations. And um, they did a lot of efforts to turn those around. Uh, in fact, I did a interview with um, their, uh, uh, with Rob McEwen, I think right around here somewhere. And uh, we talked about the efforts that they were making to turn around their their gold operations, and, and that's paying dividends now. Uh, but what really started this big move up here, uh, and that continues here, uh, basically over doubling their share price, um, was that uh, they're starting to get recognized for this copper project that they have uh, down in Argentina. And uh, it's one of the world's largest undeveloped uh, copper deposits in the world. And um, they had a plan to spin it out to shareholders in 2023. And that plan had helped the stock get performing much better. But then they got an investment by uh, 
a company called Newton, which is actually a, uh, a subsidiary or a venture, they call it, of Rio Tinto. And uh, what this company uh, has a technology that um, they believe that the technology not only does it um, uh, increase the recovery of copper, it also uh, increases the pace, the time that it takes to get the copper out uh, compared to the methods that were considered when um, um, McEwen Mining did a, uh, a prelim an economic analysis. And um, so they put about, I think it was around 20 million in then. And then recently they announced right around here and it blasted off again, that Newton is putting additional money in, I think around 30 million. Uh, just check their news releases and you'll you'll find out what the exact numbers are. But I think that this is an important development because since their first investment and their second investment, they were able to get material and start doing the hardcore analysis of their method. Uh, and the fact that they decided to put more money in I think is a pretty good idea that they believe that their technology uh, is going to work on the QN Copper's uh, a potential mine of the future. But at the, the same day that they an announced that additional investment, uh, Stellantis, which many people probably don't know the, um, the name of the company, but uh, they will know the brands of cars that they make, um, Jeep, uh, 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 plenty of cars. You can go look up Stellantis. Uh, put a uh, $150 million US dollar investment into uh, McEwen Copper, I think at around a $35 or $38 valuation. Uh, uh, the original financings of McEwen Copper were done at about $10. So that's about a 400% increase uh, and um, why Stellantis did that is because they're a company that realizes how much copper they're going to need in the future. And uh, and they realize that, you know, the mining companies are just probably not going to be able to meet the needs of the future uh, for car automobile makers uh, as they transition into uh, electric vehicles. And so they pumped a bunch of money in on the same day that Newton was announced, Stellantis announced their investment as well. So I think that's a pretty good endorsement of McEwen Copper. Um, right at this moment, McEwen Mining owns around 52% of McEwen Copper. Uh, so um, the McEwen Mining shareholders have a significant interest in McEwen Copper. And uh, I think McEwen Copper is on to big things uh, in the uh, with a future copper mine. And I think that um, the McEwen Mining's gold operations are going to significantly turn the corner. Uh, it not only helps that they're bringing down their cost of production and getting better controls on their grade control, uh, but you get a better price for gold and uh, that uh, fixes a lot of problems as well. So um, McEwen Mining is another of my top picks. Now, these first uh, group are uh, for investors that want to get into mining stocks, but they want less risk, uh, yet maintain good upside potential. So I-80 Gold, I think, is... Um, on the top of that list for me, McEwen Mining, McEwen Mining is another. Uh, Silvercrest, I think, is a uh, is a company that's going to do some great things in the future. Back in November, right around here, <clears throat> they announced that they started commercial production at their Las Chispas mine in Sonora, Mexico. And what is very exciting about that Las Chispas mine is it's it's got a very high grade and very low costs of production. So this will be a uh, uh, have very healthy profit margins. 
And um, those low cost producers with high grades are the kind of um, stocks that significantly outperform their peers. Uh, and what happened here is they, they started to get momentum uh, with the price of gold and silver, and then they came under pressure uh, right around when the US dollar took off and, um, uh, and gold and silver got under pressure. But as you can see recently, they've started to get back into overdrive. And I really believe that they're, this is, remember I showed you the little SON curve earlier? Uh, as companies move out of that transition from pre-development, development, and then into early mining, you get that big uptrend uh, in the, uh, the value stock price. And they're at that sweet spot um, where they're just starting their commercial production. And as they get a few quarters of production uh, into the uh, quarterly reports, which they recently put one out and it, their, their numbers are performing very solidly. Um, and uh, I think that this is a great candidate for a company that will significantly outperform their peers. When you're in a bull market for any metal, uh, in, in this case, gold and silver, the ones that the miners that significantly outperform their peers, it's not the big mine, the biggest mining companies. It's the ones with the big margins that have low cost production, high grade, and they make these healthy margins. And that's exactly the story for Silvercrest. And uh, they're early in that second wave of the Lasan curve. Uh, and I think this company has a lot higher to go. And uh, I'm a big fan of Silvercrest. Okay, now Orla Mining is a new producing mining company. And um, they've been on, a, as they brought their mine in, and Zacatecas, Mexico called Ro Camino Rojo into production, look at this performance. And this is indicative of what happens when you've got a low cost, high margin uh, a producer. Uh, and uh, even in the tough time for gold, it's kept on going up. It's now trading well above the 50 day moving average and well above the 200 day moving average. And again, this is the kind of performance that you can expect uh, from a new miner that has low costs and high margins. And uh, that's the story on Orla Mining. And I think it's another great candidate for investors that want exposure to uh, gold, in this case, a gold mining company uh, that protects their downside risk and gives them plenty of upside potential. If gold does what I think it's going to do, which is go much higher in 2023, I think that will be one catalyst. And then performance from their mine will be another important catalyst. So I think those catalysts will take Orla mining much higher. Mag Silver uh, is a silver focused uh, gold or silver producer. Oh, I don't think anyone wants to look at forensic magnet forensics. <laughs> I'll go to the correct Mag Silver. And um, what you can see here is they're a new mining company as well. And uh, they started to perform much better here. Uh, then they had a pretty steep correction with the price of silver going down. Then they bottomed and now they're going up. Now on a fundamentals, this is a new producer with very low costs and high grade. So it's one of your money making machines of a mine. They are focused on silver. And uh, another important recent development for them was that they were able to recently plug their uh, mine, their mill into the Mexican national power grid. And what that is enabling them to do is to bring the uh, mine into full uh, nameplate commercial production. And so they're gonna have a lot of uh, great news uh, from their mining operations during 2023. 
And, uh, and I think another important catalyst will be the price of silver going up. Um, you know, when it comes to silver focused mining companies, there's not a lot of options out there for investors, but I think Mag Silver is the premier um, silver focused mining company to pay attention to. And uh, this recent action has given you a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, I think they're, they bottomed and they're about to go a lot higher. And uh Again, for an investor that wants, believes that silver is going up and they want exposure, but they want protection of their downside and exposure to the upside, uh, this is a great candidate in mag silver. I think their their downside is, is minimal, uh, but their upside is exceptional. Uh, with the uh, performance that their mine is going to show uh, in this, in 2023, as they get into full nameplate uh, production. Plus, if you believe like I do that silver is going to go up, they've got two important catalysts throughout 2023 that I think will take it, the stock much higher. Okay, now I'm going to go into my favorite uh, part of the mining sector, which is junior mining stocks. Now, why is that <clears throat> my favorite part? Because I think it's the most important part of the entire mining sector. Why I say that is for many years, the um, major mining companies have been uh, depleting their, their known deposits. Many of them are very old, ancient, and on their deathbeds. But as they've been producing from those old mines, they haven't been, the industry has not been finding enough new mines and developing enough new mines to, to uh, replace the old mines. And this is a major argument of why I'm so bullish on the price of gold and silver and other metals is there are, many metals are in this same kind of situation where there hasn't been enough exploration, hasn't been enough exploration success, hasn't been enough new mines going into development to replace the old mines. So we've got a very uh, dynamic and exciting story uh, on the fundamentals of supply and demand for many metals, uh, gold and silver, uh, copper, zinc, um, lithium, uh, plenty of metals that uh, are going to see strong demand going forward. And so there's a couple of reasons why I'm very bullish on the juniors, especially. One of those is that their valuations are at record lows right now. Um, and, uh, and the second is how badly the major mining companies uh, need new, need exploration success. And something has recently been happening that I don't think a lot of people are realizing during much of my career, um, when a junior mining company would do a joint venture with a major mining company to explore or develop a project, the junior would get punished by the major mining company. Uh, the, and uh, lately, I've been calling, I've been seeing what I call junior friendly deals by the major mining companies with juniors. Um, you know, from my all the scars I have from dealing with majors when I was a consultant with juniors, um, it's quite shocking to me. These uh, the quality of the the junior friendly deals are and really are for uh, the benefit of the junior mining companies. And um, uh, I think that's indicative of the problem that the industry has, which is. They need new mines. They need exploration success and new mine development badly. And that's why they're willing to do these junior friendly deals. And um, I think investors should pay attention to that uh, because I think it's uh, you know an important argument of why you should look at junior mining companies. Okay, so now let's get on to my junior mining stock picks. Um, one of those is a company called Golden Lake Exploration. Golden Lake is right beside uh, Paycor, which I talked about when I was talking about IED uh, taking over Paycor. 
uh, and um, they are, and so I-80 is right beside Paycor, and Golden Lake is right beside Pay Paycor as well on the south side. Uh, I-80 is on the north side. Now, what has been the most exciting part of this whole Eureka mining camp is the uh, the Bonanza CRDs, Bonanza grade CRDs that I-80 Gold and Paycor have been finding. And Golden Lake has one of those on their property as well, with very high grades of silver, lead, zinc, and high grades of gold. And uh, uh, they also, in addition to having drilled into one of those kind of CRDs, there was a bunch of historical mining workings on their property. Uh, see, uh, Eureka was a very important mining camp in Nevada from the 1860s to the 1960s because of the CRDs being so high grade uh, that it was an important part of mining in Nevada. But then from the 1960s until recently when I-80 Gold and Paycor have started having success, um, it was kind of uh, lost in the shuffle, if you will. I-80 Gold and Paycor have found remarkable uh, bonanza grade CRDs that look like they'll be future cash making cash making machines in um, uh, when they are in production. But little Golden Lake, oh, I forgot to bring Golden Lake stock truck. Oh, sorry about that. Let me bring it up right now. Um, so as you can see here, this is a ten cent stock sitting beside what I think are elephant deposits. And I think that they also have the makings of an elephant deposit on their property where they've already had a couple holes into a uh, Bonanza grade CRD with a bunch of historical mines on their property. Then they did a big sampling program and found more of this high grade uh, silver, lead, zinc and gold. So it looks like not only do they have one deposit to expand on, but they're probably going to find more. And in this case, you get a, under a $10 million valuation. Uh, and I think that they've got a great future ahead of them. Uh, in addition to being a sponsor of my shows, I'm also an advisor to this company. Um, so I like the Golden Lake exploration story a lot. Um, another sponsor of my show that's also in the Eureka camp is a company called Timberline Resources. Uh, in fact, earlier today, they put out a, uh, a news release that they talked about uh, their key assets in the Eureka camp uh, and their plans to, to move those forward uh, coming up very soon. One of them is a, um, is a resource that they have uh, that they're advancing, and it's a pretty sizable resource as well. What excites me the most about that resource is as they drill to the east, uh, all the rock packages and the mineralization is going towards this big geophysical anomaly. And I believe that that geophysical anomaly is the source of the resource that they have already found. And um, uh, I think that it's got the potential to get a lot bigger. Uh, and I'll be very eager to see them drill into that big geophysical anomaly. But then uh, about a couple months ago, they did a bunch of, or they announced the results of doing a bunch of surface sampling on what's called their New York Canyon project. The New York Canyon project is directly adjacent to uh, Paycor's project and in close proximity to both I-80 Gold and Golden Lake. And on their property, uh, there was also a lot of historical mining of CRDs back in the day. Uh, and they did a bunch of sampling and sure enough, they found uh, the same things that Paycor, IED Gold and Golden Lake are finding. High grades of silver, lead, zinc and gold uh, on, on their New York Canyon project. And I believe they said today that when they start drilling again, that's the first target they're going to be drilling. I, I think that they've got something great going to come out of their CRD targets on the New York Canyon project. Uh, as you can see, uh, oh, I forgot to bring their stock chart up. 
let me rectify that right now. Uh, here's Timberline. So they haven't been getting nearly as much love as I-80 Gold, Paycor, and Golden Lake are. Uh, but I happen to think they're very oversold here, uh, considering the quality of their gold project, that the resource that they're growing, and also their potential to find CRDs at their New York Canyon project. And I think that their other project that uh, in, in close proximity to their resource, that there's a potential that they could find CRDs is there as well. Uh, but they're very oversold. They're a sponsor of the show. I think that they've got a lot higher to go. The key catalyst for that will be as they get more drilling underway. And all obviously, if the gold price does what I think it does, um, you know, these kind of companies um, are not easy to find. Uh, and I think that they're very oversold. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Walker River Resources. Uh, they're also a sponsor of my uh, reports. And uh, what excites me about Walker River Resources is they're in the uh, western part of Nevada in what's called the Walker, uh, Walker Lane Trend. And uh, at their, uh, uh, their uh, La Ponte Canyon project, uh, there was, they found an area on the side of a mountain. I call it La Ponte Mountain. Uh, and there was historical mining uh, and their own drilling uh, that has found widespread high-grade gold mineralization from side to side in the mountain for about 600 meters and from top to bottom on that mountain about 800 meters. Uh, and I believe it's still open. So I, I've commented that I think that this company has a, a two to five million ounce gold target that could be bigger, much bigger than that. Uh, and those are really hard to find, by the way, uh, in Nevada, anywhere in the world, to, to be honest. And um, what, um, what um, uh, there's additional information that makes me believe what I'm saying. Uh, in on that mountain, there's a network of structures. Okay, so these structures are important conduits or path of least resistance that the uh, the gold bearing fluids make their way up from deeper through these faults, and then when they get close to the surface, they can spread out. Evidence that they spread out like that is when these gold bearing fluids make their way up to surface and they interact with the country rock, uh, they will chemically alter that country rock. So not only do you have widespread uh, gold mineralization based on drilling and historical mining, but you've also got this network of faulting and this uh, big area of alteration. That to me, those factors are why I believe that Walker River Resources has found themselves what I consider a two to five million ounce gold target in, in Nevada. And uh, uh, they have a very cheap valuation. Um, these things are hard to find. Uh, and um, I believe that they've got a lot of blue sky ahead of them because these are the kind of things that major mining companies want to be involved with and can't find enough of. Uh, and Walker River Resources has one of those. And uh, I, I don't think it's very long before they'll get better recognition for what they have. All right, so now we're gonna move on to BlackRock Silver. Uh, BlackRock Silver, I have, I have an interview set up with BlackRock Silver uh, tomorrow morning actually. Um, so I'm going to be able to talk to Andrew Pollard and, and we're going to be able to uh, talk about the company more uh, more in depth. But I think this company is dramatically oversold here. And uh, I think that the key assets that they have, which I will talk more about with Andrew Pollard tomorrow morning, is their Tonopah project. Uh, at their Tonopah project, they have a high-grade resource of copper, around 54 million ounces of uh, copper, sorry, not copper, silver. Uh, and I think they've got fantastic opportunities to grow that 
well over 100 million ounces, probably well over 200 million ounces. Uh, I believe that at their Tone and Prop project, they have a mine of the future. Uh, it has many of the characteristics of the Las Chispas mine owned by Silvercrest. I talked about Silvercrest earlier. What makes that Las Chispas mine so uh, impressive is that it's got low cost to produce it and very high grades, and that makes for a high margin mine. And I think Black Rock Silver has one of those kind of important mines of the future. Uh, they're in the same kind of geological uh, formation, the epithermal veins. Uh, epithermal veins are very important sources of both gold and silver. And uh, I think at Tonopah, they have a, a mine of the future that will be mined by a much bigger company that ultimately ends up, I think this company ends up getting bought out uh, at significant multiples of their current valuation. Uh, so, but that's not the only key asset that they have. Another great gold and silver asset that they have is called Silver Cloud. And uh, at Silver Cloud, they, um, uh, right around here, they announced December, January, they announced uh, Bonanza grades of silver and gold from that, uh, that epithermal vein at Silver, or silver Cloud. Uh, it was just, spectacular numbers, uh, 70 grams of gold and 600 grams of silver. Uh, what that tells you when they hit those kind of grades is that the company has drilled into the boiling zone up an, of an epithermal vein. That's an extremely important milestone because in these epithermal veins, they have what's called zonation of grade. And what that means is that um, there's what's called a boiling zone. Think of it like a pot of water boiling. Um, when you're above the boiling zone, you're just going to sort of get the bubbles that are boiling. And then when you get into the boiling zone, the hot water that's boiling, that's where you find mines. And uh, they have tagged that boiling zone. And when a company uh, finds the boiling zone of an epithermal vein, it gets very exciting because then they can expand on that, uh, both along strike and at depth. And uh, they they found a spectacular boiling zone in an epithermal vein. Like I said, 70 grams of gold and uh, 600 grams of silver. Uh, I think they've got a heck of a, a situation on their hands at Silver Cloud. Yet the stock has been just pummeled down to beyond 52 week lows. I mean, when do you gotta go? You gotta go back to July of 2020 uh, to see them at these valuations. Uh, I think the market is very much undervaluing the quality of assets that BlackRock Silver has in gold and silver. And um, I think this one's got, uh, this one's a great turnaround story. And as I said, I'm gonna be interviewing Andrew Pollard, the CEO of the company, tomorrow so we'll go into more depth about this company but rest assured i believe that this company is very undervalued right now okay athena problem with athena is stock charts doesn't uh i don't believe oh they 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 give you the quote in the bulletin board but not in the uh the pink sheets in the u.s but not in the canadian chart um, but it's very similar. The stock's been going sideways. But what shocks me is that this little company with a sub $10 million valuation has what I believe is an exceptional discovery in the Walker Lane trend of Western Nevada. Why I say that, and I've done some interviews because this company is also a sponsor of my shows, I've done some interviews with their management and the key takeaways are that they've drilled three holes with oxide gold and foreign oxide gold hits. These are bonanza grades, so over 10 grams per ton uh, of gold in, the, in oxides. And so right now, 
a lot of oxide mines are like a half a gram and they can make nothing but money mining a half a gram. So this is a multi-gram um, uh, discovery in only three holes into it so far. So then when I start doing my homework, the next thing I look at is the structural story because the structures are the path of least resistance that the fluids uh, that carry the gold and other metals follow in order to make their way up to surface. And so they've got this, this uh, on the south side, they've got a big um, structure. And on the north side, they've got a big structure. And then right in between, they got this huge area of alteration. And that tells you that the gold bearing fluids and other metals bearing fluids have chemically altered the rock. And so that suggests that they've got a big discovery on their hands. And then they've got these three holes with bonanza grades for an oxide discovery, and they're getting no attention, no love whatsoever. Uh, this is the kind of thing that when the market wakes up and understands that they've got, they're an undiscovered gem, this is the kind of thing that's going to go up multiples of their current valuation. Uh, I did a special report on them recently that you can find on my uh, rocksandstocks.substack.com or on my YouTube channel at Rocks and Stocks News on YouTube. Uh, and I highly advise you to take a look at that report and then go back. And I did two other interviews with management of the company. This is an undiscovered gem that I think could be a phoenix rising from the ashes story. Uh, and when they start getting attention, uh, I think it will trade at multiples of their current valuation. All right, another sponsor that sort of is a uh, phoenix rising from the ashes kind of story is Masivo Silver. Uh, Masivo Silver is also in uh, Nevada and um, they uh, are, are on a project that saw mining a very high grade uh, material back around World War II. And then they didn't see anything for decades. And then a couple companies went in and did some, some minimal drilling and, uh, and then left. And Masivo Silver went in there and uh, they, felt that the drilling was in the wrong direction relative to the direction of the uh, mineralization. And so, and they also believed that the mineralization continued underneath those old workings. So they've drilled and reported one hole so far that has proved that they, that the mineralization below the old mine workings continues and that the, uh, past drillers were drilling at an incorrect angle relative to the mineralization. So they've gone in there with a new um, game plan and new theory of what is happening here. And they prove, they're proving that with their first hole. They have a bunch more holes that are pending. Um, they've got some really exceptionally talented people on their team. Brian Brewer, who is their QP geologist, has had a lot of success in his uh, career. One of those big successes was a company called Mine Finders. And uh, they they made a big discovery and ended up getting taken over at a huge win for the shareholders. So this guy knows what he's doing on how to find big, important new discoveries that can be taken over. And uh, I really like the uh, prospects of Massivo Silver going forward. Uh, not just because of what they have in Nevada, by the way. They've also got projects uh, down in Mexico uh, that look quite interesting as well. And uh, so Masivo Silver uh, is a uh, one you want to take a look at. Okay, now I've got an Orogenic Gold uh, company. My pages are mixed up here. Um I'm supposed to have an Orogenic Gold Explorer uh, to talk. Oh, yes, I do. Sorry, getting things mixed up, but I'm all right now. 
Okay, so why I like Origin and Gold System so so much is because of the success that um, uh, Kirkland Lake had in Australia at the Fosterville mine when they mined the Swan Zone uh, at the Fosterville mine. It was an orogenic gold system. And uh, what makes these things special is that they're not super big in size of the ore body, but they have very low cost of getting the gold out of there and very high uh, grades. This makes for very big margins. And when you have a uh, low cost, high grade, uh, high margin operation, it did, does what happened to Kirkland Lake. Uh, they were one of the best performing gold mining stocks while they were uh, producing at, uh, at the Swan Zone. Uh, and uh, they, when they started mining there, they were a pretty sizable company to start with, but this sent them into orbit and they were ultimately bought out. While they were in production at Swan Zone, they were one of the best performing uh, gold mining stocks in the business and uh, uh, ultimately got bought out. So if it was able to do those kind of things for um, a fairly big company like Kirkland Lake, it can do wonderful things for small juniors. And uh, there's certain milestones that you want to watch for. And Sokeman Minerals has reached those important milestones in an orogenic gold system. And what that key milestone is, is that when they start tagging into bonanza grades of gold uh, in those orogenic gold systems. Now, oftentimes you got to go deeper to do that. And uh, they've done that, and uh, they they announced it right around here. Um, zoom out a little. They did it, announced it right around here, and uh, the stock did very well. Uh, but then they've come under pressure, like a lot of junior mining companies, and they're back to the price that you could buy them before they made the discovery of the bonanza grades in a orogenic gold system. I think they're very oversold here. They're currently drilling uh, near where they found those bonanza grades and uh, lots of news pending from their current drilling. Uh, they've also got a great lithium project that I think has uh, uh, got the potential to be a big success for them. Um, so that's uh, that's one that I think is very oversold and uh, has the catalyst to make it uh, outperform its peers uh, from their gold project and their lithium project. They're drilling right now. They have assay results pending, uh, very oversold here. And another important catalyst, of course, is gold going much higher. Uh, so Sokeman Minerals has a lot of... Uh, catalysts to help it go from oversold to maybe overbought. <laughs> All right, uh, Galantis Gold is another one that I follow closely because of their uh, orogenic gold system in uh, Ireland. Uh, and in fact, they're currently doing a private placement that I'm participating in because I think the, gold, the stock is so uh, oversold here. Um, they've got a uh, orogenic gold system that they've already drilled into the uh, high grade to bonanza grades of gold. Uh, that's an important milestone when you're looking at an orogenic gold system. And um, I, uh, I think that not only do they have the Joshua and Kearney vein and more veins around it, but these orogenic gold systems can go down two, 3,000 meters and as you get deeper, you get into closer to the boiling or the heat engine of what caused all this mineralization. They've done most of their drilling within the first couple hundred meters of surface. And I think the real game changer for them is that as they go deeper, uh, that the grades are gonna get even higher and they could have some of these fantastic bonanza grades, not very far much deeper than where they're currently, where their past drilling has been done fairly close to surface. 
So, and then they added a VMS project in uh, Scotland that I think is quite interesting as well. Um, the one that excites me the most being a gold junkie and a high grade gold, high grade gold junkie at that is their uh, project in Ireland. And um, uh, I think that they're going to get drilling again deeper and follow these uh, gold, the orogenic gold system deeper. And I think that that's going to be a real key to dramatic um, outperformance. And uh, right here, you're getting it right at about a triple bottom or a double bottom. Uh, and I think this one's very oversold as well. Uh, Dynasty Gold. Uh, Dynasty Gold is just very early into uh, what I talked about earlier when junior miners drilling into an orogenic gold system start tagging the Bonanza grades and they certainly have at their project in Dryden, Ontario. They had one intersection that was 246 grams per ton of gold. That helped see this action. Um, and then, you know, whenever something goes parabolic like that, it usually takes some time to, to sort of flush that move out. Um, but as you can see here, they went through a golden cross. They're right now trading on their 50 day moving average. Uh, they, the 200 day moving average is now up in the upwards direction. Um, when you when you look at high grade gold occurrences, what you also want to see in these orogenic gold system is continuity. And they actually have four holes that cover about 150 meters of strike where they've hit high grade in all four of those holes and they're actually lining up into what looks like a, a, a continuous zone of high grade to bonanza grade gold. And then below that, it looks like they also have a second uh, zone developing uh, below that. They're only about four holes into what I think is a jewelry box, swan zone type discovery. Uh, and uh, I've been in close contact with their geological team. They plan on uh, going deeper and following that continuity and finding out more about this second zone that's below the the, the main zone. Uh, and um, I think they've got something very special here at Dynasty Gold. Uh, and, um, you know, the stock has done very well for shareholders uh, in 2023. Uh, and I think it's going to do much better for shareholders as they get drilling back on their um, uh, their Thundercloud project uh, in Dryden, Ontario. Okay, um, next I'm going to move on to base metal stocks. Uh, and I have a sponsor uh, in my base metals. That's a company called uh, Nine Mile Metals. Nine Mile Metals is focused on a, uh, in the Bathurst mining camp of, um, of uh, New Brunswick. This is one of the most important, the top three VMS mining camps worldwide. Uh, and um, it's known to have a lot of very big deposits on in it. And uh, this, as often happens with these old mining camps, uh, new technology comes along and is applied to that camp and new discoveries are made. Nine Mile Metals has found two new uh, discoveries 20 kilometers apart of massive sulfides with very high grades uh, in those massive sulfides right at surface uh, that look wide open to find the source of where those uh, those massive sulfide occurrences came from. And uh, they're drilling right now, uh, and I like their chances to deliver excellent uh, results uh, from their drilling. The market has come down quite significantly recently. Uh, it had been on a very exceptional move for most of 2022 and 2023. Uh, recently come under pressure. It's looking pretty oversold to me. 
Um, you know, I love these stories of companies going into old mining camps, using modern methods for exploration and new technology, and um, and and that leads them to success. Uh, and I think that that's what's in the store for Nine Mile Meadows now. Sometimes these juniors, uh, they can they get uh, a lot of optimism priced in and then quickly have pessimism. Uh, I think that this is oversold here. Uh, you have to go back to uh, June of 2022 to have been able to buy it for around this price. Uh, and I think it's pretty oversold here. Uh, and uh, I'll be looking for uh, results from their uh, drilling that's currently underway. Okay, in Mexico uh, is my company, Advanced Lithium, where I'm the uh, CEO and also a big shareholder of the company. Uh, we were having a lot of problems in this area here uh, because Mexico was talking about nationalizing the lithium industry. And... Um, uh, when what they actually announced was that they're starting a national uh, lithium mining company called Lithium Max, and uh, <coughs> um, what um, what um, uh, they also did was change the mining laws to put a moratorium on staking new projects, uh, and yet they. The constitution is very strong in Mexico regarding the changing of mining laws, and they're not allowed to do that retroactively uh, to affect projects in good standing, which we have 13 of these salt lakes uh, in Mexico with lithium and potassium in them, and they are in good standing. But nonetheless, as much as I tried to communicate these things to uh, the public, the stock got hammered down and went flat for several months. Uh, but then uh, recently we've come out of those doldrums. And the reason is that we put out an announcement that we have started discussions with uh, Lithium Max about the possibility of creating a joint venture on our lithium projects. Uh, and then we also had good news out because we um, have uh, done a deal to create, uh, to get a, uh, 170 square kilometers in the Bathurst mining camp of New Brunswick. As I was talking about when I talked about Nine Mile Metals is that this is a uh, one of these old mining areas that are being revived with new technology. Uh, and this big land package we have has historical resources on it. One of them is was done in the 1960s, long before National Instrument 43101 came around, uh, but it had some 25 million tons to it. Uh, and they think that the geologists that were assessing that believe that that's the debris flow from a primary VMS deposit. So the debris flow is that big. It tells you about how the size potential of the primary VMS that it came from. Then there's six other uh, known uh, 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 resources on it that were done prior to National Instrument 43101, and uh, and uh, they um, uh, they also need to be drilled. There's an area where there's a cluster of uh, very high grade boulders that the bedrock source of that's never been found. There's a uh, epithermal vein system that. Uh, uh, when Wolfden had it, which is the company that we optioned it from, had that project, they drilled into some spectacularly high grades of silver. So that tells you that they had drilled into the boiling zone of those uh, of epithermal veins. And so now that's open for expansion, a long strike and at depth. And they've already proven that they've they hit the boiling zone of those epithermal veins. The two big mines in the are two of the well, the biggest one was the Brunswick number 12 mine. I think it was about 150 million tons was actually produced from that mine. Uh, and it stopped because it got they got so deep, it, the grades were fine, but it was becoming too uh, dangerous for the miners. Uh, and it's estimated to be somewhere around 300 million tons. So it's a 
major elephant for a VMS deposit. And then to the immediate south of that is the Brunswick number six mine. And we've got a big land package right in close proximity to Brunswick number six and Brunswick number 12. Uh, so, and then we've also got a great project called Serape uh, for gold and silver. Earlier, I was talking about how bullish I am about Silvercrest because of their last Chispas mine. Well, just to the immediate north of last the last Chispas area is the uh, our Serape project that's about 55 square kilometers, has two known vein epithermal veins on it, just like uh, uh, what's being mined in the area. And only about a half a dozen holes have ever been drilled on these. One's five kilometers, one's two kilometers. The two kilometer one only had one hole ever drilled in it. And the five kilometer one only had about five holes into the vein. Uh, and I don't believe that they have hit the boiling zone of those epithermal veins. So when you're in an area so close to Las Chispas, and you've got two big veins that uh, have never really, uh, I don't think they've drilled into the boiling zones of those uh, epithermal veins. Um, uh, I don't believe that the, uh, that the, the, the guts of that system has been found yet. Uh, and I'm very bullish on that uh, project. So we've got three excellent projects that when you look at them collectively, Take, for example, the um, uh, the Brunswick, our New Brunswick projects that we now call our Bathurst Mining Camp projects. To reproduce the work that was done in the past on our projects, you would be looking at multiples of our current valuation. Um, so for us to be able to go in there, and and now we have a... We just got in there uh, and uh, and you've got that kind of work it would have taken to get in there or to do replace the work. We're trading a, a fraction of the cost that it would cost you in order to do that work today. Um, so I make the case that I believe we're very undervalued uh, and are one that I think is worth uh, investors taking a look at. I've got a bunch of other stocks to talk about here, but I, I I realized that this show has gone on for much longer than I had anticipated. So I'm going to end the show uh, now and uh, get back to uh, more picks in my next show. Uh, but um, as I've, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I think, you know, you have to speak before you make any investment decisions, you have to talk to your financial advisors and assess whether the uh, your wh whether it's right for your risk profile. And that applies to any company I talk about or any company you ever consider investing in. And then you also have to do your homework. You have to, I, I help you with that because I do a lot of interviews in these sector reports where I tell you about these companies and, and talk to their management so you can learn more about them. Another great resource is to go to their uh, websites and look at their news releases and their corporate presentations. Um, you can go to my YouTube channel at Rocks and Stocks News or my Substack location at rocksandstocks.substack.com and find those interviews and, and that will help you do your homework. Uh, and uh, I believe the main reason to do your homework is you want to be well informed about the companies you invest in. That way you make logical investment decisions. Uh, I find a lot of investors, they sort of look to the stock, day-to-day -day stock activity to assess whether or not something's worth looking at. And I believe that makes you an emotional trader. Uh, and I think you're best off to be a logical trader and uh, do that homework. So on that note, have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.